The Book of Judith, Chapter 1 It was the twelfth year of the reign of Seleucus, who ruled over the Assyrians. In those days, Arsaces ruled over the Medes in Ecbatana. Around this city, he built walls of hewn stones, each three cubits thick and six cubits long. He made the walls 70 cubits high and 50 cubits wide. At its gates, he raised towers 100 cubits high and 60 cubits wide at the base. The gateway he built to a height of 70 cubits, with an opening 40 cubits wide for the passage of his chariot forces and his infantry to form their ranks. Then, King Seleucus waged war against King Arsaces in the great plain that is on the border of Rajas. There, many nations rallied to him. These included all the people of the mountain region, and all those who dwelt along the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Hydaspes, and, on the plain, King Arioch of the Elameans. Thus, many nations joined the forces of the Chaldeans. Then King Seleucus of the Assyrians sent messengers to all who lived in Persia, and to all who dwelt in the west, to the inhabitants of Cilicia and Damascus, Lebanon and anti-Lebanon, and to all who dwelt along the seacoast, and to the peoples of Carmel and Gilead and Upper Galilee and the great plain of Jezreel, and to all who were in Samaria and its cities, and beyond the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem and Bethania and Kelis, in Kadesh, in the river of Egypt, in Topanes, in Ramses, in the whole land of Goshen, even beyond Zoan in Memphis, and to all the inhabitants of Egypt, as far as the borders of Cush. But the inhabitants of the whole region disregarded the summons of King Seleucus of the Assyrians and refused to go with him to war. For they were not afraid of him, but regarded him as a lone man opposed to them. So they sent back his messengers empty-handed and in disgrace. Then Seleucus fell into a violent rage against this whole region, and swore by his throne and his kingdom that he would take revenge on the whole territory of Cilicia and Damascus and Aram, that he would also kill all the inhabitants of the land of Moab with his sword, along with the people of Ammon and all Judah, and everyone in Egypt as far as the coasts of the two seas. In the seventeenth year, he led his forces against King Arsaces and defeated him in battle, routing the whole army of Arsaces along with all his cavalry and all his chariots. Thus he took possessions of his cities and pressed on to Ecbatana, captured its towers, plundered its markets, and turned its glory into shame. He overtook Arsaces in the mountains of Rajas and ran him through with his spears, thus destroying him once and for all. Then he returned with them, he, along with his entire motley army, an enormous horde of warriors. And there, he and his forces rested and feasted for 120 days. Chapter 2 In the eighteenth year, on the twenty-second day of the first month, there was a discussion in the palace of King Seleucus of the Assyrians about carrying out his revenge upon the whole world as he had threatened. He summoned all his ministers and all his nobles and set before them his secret plan. And with his own lips, he urged 
the total destruction of these countries. They decided to destroy all those who had refused to obey his command. When he had completed his plan, King Seleucus of the Assyrians summoned Holofernes, the commander-in-chief of his army, second only to himself, and said to him, Thus says the great king, the lord of all the earth, Go forth from my presence and take men with you of proven valor, 120,000 infantry, and 12,000 cavalry, and march out against all the land to the west because they disobeyed my orders. Tell them to have earth and water ready, for I am coming against them in my wrath. I will cover the whole face of the earth with the feet of my soldiers, to whom I will hand them over to be plundered. Their slain shall fill their ravines and gullies, and the swelling torrent shall be choked with their dead. I will lead them away as exiles to the ends of the whole earth. You shall go before me and seize all their territories for me. If they surrender to you, guard them for me until the day of their punishment. As for those who resist, show them no mercy, but hand them over to slaughter and plunder throughout your whole country. For as I live, and by the strength of my kingdom, what I have spoken I will accomplish by my own hand. And you, do not transgress a single one of your Lord's commands, but carry them out exactly as I have ordered you, and do it without delay. So Holofernes left the presence of his Lord and summoned all the princes and the generals and officers of the Assyrian army. As ordered by his lord, he mustered 120,000 picked troops and 12,000 mounted archers, and he organized them as a great army as marshaled for a campaign. He took along a vast number of camels and donkeys and mules for their baggage and innumerable sheep and oxen and goats for their food supply. Also, ample rations for each man, and a huge amount of gold and silver from the royal palace. Then he set out with his whole army on their expedition in advance of King Seleucus to cover the whole face of the western earth with their chariots and cavalry and picked foot soldiers. Along with them went a multitude that could not be counted, a huge mixed force like locusts, like the dust of the earth. After a three-day march from Nineveh, they reached the plain of Bactilith. And from Bactilith, they encamped near the mountains to the north of Upper Cilicia. From there, Holofernes advanced into the mountain region with his whole army, the infantry, cavalry, and chariots. He ravaged Put and Lud, and plundered all the Rassasites and the Ishmaelites on the border of the desert toward the south of the country of the Chaldeans. Then, following the Euphrates, he passed through Aram Nearam and battered down every fortified city along the Abron Wadi until he reached the sea. He also seized the territory of Cilicia and cut down everyone who resisted him. He then proceeded to the southern borders of Japheth toward Arabia. He surrounded all the Midianites and burned their tents and plundered their sheepfolds. Going down into the plain of Damascus during the wheat harvest, he set fire to all their fields and destroyed their flocks and herds and despoiled their cities and ravaged their plains and put all their young men to the sword. So fear and dread of him fell upon all the inhabitants of the coastland, upon those in Sidon and Tyre, and those who lived in Sur and Achaina, and all the inhabitants of Jamnia. The inhabitants of Ashdod and Ashkelon feared him greatly. 
chapter 3. Therefore, they sent messengers to him to sue for peace in these words. We, the servants of the great king Seleucus, lie prostrate before you. Do with us whatever you will. See, our buildings in all our land, and all our wheat fields, and our flocks and herds, and all our encampments are at your disposal. Do with them as you please. Our cities and their inhabitants are also your slaves. Come and deal with them as you see fit. After the men came to Holofernes and told him all this, he went down with his army to the seacoast and stationed garrisons in the fortified cities. And from them he impressed picked men as auxiliaries. These people in the cities and all the inhabitants in the countryside welcomed him with garlands and dances and tambourines. Nevertheless, he demolished all their shrines and cut down their sacred groves. For he had been commissioned to destroy all the gods of the earth so that every nation might worship Seleucus alone, and that every language and tribe might invoke him as a god. At length, Holofernes reached Jezreel, in the neighborhood of Dothan, the approach to the main ridge of the Judean mountains. He set up his camp between Geba and Scythopolis, and remained there for a whole month in order to refurbish all the equipment of his army. Chapter 4 when the Israelites living in Judah heard of everything that Holofernes, the commander-in-chief of King Seleucus of the Assyrians, had done to the nations, and how he had despoiled and destroyed all their shrines, they were extremely terrified at his approach. They were greatly alarmed, both for Jerusalem and for the temple of the Lord their God for they had lately returned from exile, and only recently had all the people of Judah been gathered together. And the vessels, and the altar, and the temple had been purified from profanation. So they sent word to every district of Samaria, and to Kona, Beth Horan, Balmain, and Jericho, and to Koba, and Asora, and the Valley of Salem, they immediately posted guards on all the high mountain summits and fortified the villages on them. And since their fields had recently been harvested, they stored up provisions in preparation for war. The high priest, Jehoiakim, who was in Jerusalem at that time, wrote to the inhabitants of Bethulia and Betomestheum which is on the way to Jezreel, facing the plain near Dothan. And he instructed them to keep a firm hold of the mountain passes, since these offered access to Judah. And because the approach was narrow, wide enough for only two at a time to pass through, it would be easy to ward off the attacking forces. So the Israelites carried out the orders given to them by the high priest Jehoiakim and the senate of the whole people of Israel in session at Jerusalem. And all the men of Israel cried out to God with great fervor, and they humbled their souls with much fasting. They, along with their women and their children and their cattle, and every resident alien and hired laborers and purchased slaves, they all girded themselves with sackcloth. And all the Israelite men, women, and children living at Jerusalem prostrated themselves in front of the temple with ashes strewn on their heads and displaying their sackcloth before the Lord. They even draped the altar with sackcloth. And with one accord, they cried out fervently to the Lord God of Israel not to allow their children to be seized, 
or their women to be taken as booty, or their inherited cities to be destroyed, or the sanctuary to be profaned and desecrated for the nations to gloat over. The Lord heard their cry and had regard for their distress. For the people fasted many days throughout Judah and before the sanctuary of the Lord Almighty in Jerusalem. The high priest Jehoiakim, along with all the priests who stood before the Lord and ministered to the Lord, were girded with sackcloth as they offered the daily holocaust, the votive offerings, and the freewill offerings of the people. With ashes on their turbans, they cried out to the Lord with all their strength to look with favor upon the whole house of Israel. Chapter 5 It was reported to Holofernes, commander-in-chief of the Assyrian army, that the Israelites had prepared for war and had blockaded the mountain passes and fortified the summits of all the higher peaks and set up barricades in the plains. In great anger, he called together all the rulers of Moab and all the generals of Ammon and all the governors of the coastland and said to them, Tell me, you Canaanites, what sort of people is this that lives in the mountains? What cities do they inhabit? How large is their army? And in what does their power and strength consist? Who rules over them as king and leads their army? And why have they alone, of all who live in the West, refused to come out and meet me? Then Achior, the leader of all the Ammonites, said to him, My lord, please listen to the report from the mouth of your servant, and I will tell you the truth about this people that lives in the mountain region near you. No falsehood shall escape your servant's mouth. These people are descendants of the Chaldeans. At one time they lived in Aram Nehoram because they did not wish to follow the gods of their forefathers who were in Chaldea. Since they had abandoned the ways of their forefathers and worshipped the God of heaven, the God they had come to know, their forefathers drove them out from the presence of their gods. So they fled to Aram Nehoram and lived there for a long time. Then their God commanded them to leave their abode and proceed to the land of Canaan. There they settled and grew very prosperous in gold and silver and a great abundance of livestock. When a famine spread over the land of Canaan, they went down to Egypt and lived there as long as they found sustenance. There they grew into such a great multitude that their race could not be counted. However, the king of Egypt rose up against them. He exploited them, forcing them to make bricks, thus reducing them to slavery. But they cried out to their God, and he afflicted the whole land of Egypt with incurable plagues. So the Egyptians drove them out of their sight. Then God dried up the sea of reeds before them and led them along a route to Sinai and Kadesh Barnea. They drove out all the people of the desert and took up residence in the land of the Amorites and by their might destroyed all the inhabitants of Heshbon. And crossing over the Jordan, they took possession of the whole mountain region. They drove out before them the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Shechemites, and all the Girgashites. And they lived in these mountains a long time. As long as the Israelites did not sin against their God, they prospered, for the God who hates iniquity is with them. But when they deviated from the way he had prescribed for them, they were utterly defeated in many battles and were taken as captives to a foreign land. The temple of their God was razed to the ground and their cities were occupied by their enemies. But now they have returned to their God. They have come back from the dispersion in which they were scattered and have repossessed Jerusalem where their sanctuary is and have settled in the mountain region which was uninhabited. So now, my Lord and Master, if these people are at fault and they are sinning against their God, and if we verify their offense, then we shall be able to go up and conquer them. But if they are not a guilty nation, 
then let my Lord pass them by. Otherwise, their Lord and God will shield them, and we shall become the laughingstock of the whole world. Now when Achior had concluded his recommendation, all the people standing around the tent began to murmur. And Holofernes' officers, and all the inhabitants of the seacoast and of Moab, insisted that he should be cut to pieces. They said, We are not afraid of the Israelites, for they are a powerless people, incapable of making a strong defense. Therefore, Lord Holofernes, let us go up, and your great army will ingest them. Chapter 6 When the noise of the crowd surrounding the council had subsided, Holofernes, the commander-in-chief of the Assyrian army, said to Achior and to the Ammonite mercenaries in the presence of all the foreign contingents, Who are you, Achior, and you, Ammonite mercenaries? to prophesy among us as you have done today, and tell us not to make war against the people of Israel, because their God will defend them. What God is there except Seleucus? He will send his forces and destroy them from the face of the earth. Their God will not save them, but we, the king's servants, will strike them down as one man, for they will be unable to resist the might of our cavalry. We will overwhelm them with it, and their mountains will be drunk with their blood, and their plains will be filled with their corpses. Not even their footprints will survive our attack. They will utterly perish, says King Seleucus, Lord of the whole earth. For he has spoken, and none of his words shall be in vain. As for you, Achior, you Ammonite mercenary, for saying these words in a moment of perversity, you shall not see my face again from this day until I have taken revenge on this race of people that came out of Egypt. Then at my return, the sword of my army and the spear of my servants will pierce your sides, and you shall fall among their slain. Now my slaves are going to take you back into the mountain region and leave you in one of the towns along the passes. You shall not die until you perish together with them. If you cherish the hope in your heart that they will not be taken, then do not look downcast. I have spoken, and none of my words shall prove false in any respect. Then Holofernes ordered his slaves who waited on him in his tent, to seize Achior and conduct him to Bethulia and hand him over to the Israelites. So the slaves took him into custody and brought him out of the camp into the plain. And from the plain, they went up into the mountain region until they reached the springs below Bethulia. When its citizens saw them, they seized their weapons and ran out of the city to the crest of the ridge. And all the slingers blocked the slaves' ascent by hurling stones upon them. So having taken shelter below the mountain, they bound Achior and left him lying at the foot of the mountain, and they returned to their lord. Then the Israelites came down from their city and found him. They untied him and brought him into Bethulia. And they hailed him before the magistrates of the city, who in those days were Isaiah, son of Micah, of the tribe of Simeon, and Cabras, son of Othaniel, and Carmi, son of Melchiel. They then convened all the elders of the city, and all their young men, as well as the women, gathered in haste at the place of assembly. They placed Achior in the center of all their people, and Uzziah questioned him about what had happened. He replied by giving them an account of what had taken place at the council of Holofernes, and of all that he had spoken in the presence of the Assyrian officers, and of all the boasting threats that Holofernes would do against the house of Israel. 
At this, the people fell prostrate and worshipped God. And they cried out, O Lord, God of heaven, behold their arrogance! And have pity upon the lowliness of our people, and look with favor this day upon the faces of those who are consecrated to you. Then they reassured Achior, and praised him highly. Uzziah brought him from the assembly to his own house, where he gave a banquet for the elders. And that entire night they called upon the God of Israel for help. Chapter 7 The next day, Holofernes ordered his whole army and all the allies who had come to his support to break camp and move against Bethulia and to seize the mountain passes and engage the Israelites in battle. So that same day, all their warriors marched into action. Their fighting forces numbered 170,000 infantry and 20,000 cavalry, not counting the baggage train and the foot soldiers handling it, a very great multitude. They encamped in the valley near Bethulia, beside the spring, and they spread out in breath toward Dothan, as far as Belbaum, and in length from Bethulia to Siamon, which faces Jezreel. When the Israelites saw the vastness of their numbers, they were greatly terrified and said to one another, Soon they will devour the whole land. Neither the high mountains nor the valleys nor the hills are able to support their mass. Yet they all seized their weapons, and when they had kindled fires on their bastions, they kept watch throughout the entire night. On the second day, Holofernes let out all his cavalry in full view of the Israelites who were in Bethulia. He reconnoitered the approaches to their city and located the springs that supplied their water. He seized them and stationed armed detachments around them and then returned to his army. Then all the commanders of the sons of Esau and all the leaders of the Moabites, together with the generals of the seacoast, came to Holofernes and said, My lord, listen to what we have to say, that your troops may suffer no losses. This people, the Israelites, do not rely on their spears, but on the height of the mountains where they dwell for it is not easy to reach the summits of their mountains. Therefore, my lord, do not fight against them in regular formation. Thus not a single man of your troops will fall. Remain in your camp and spare all your soldiers. Have some of your servants take possession of the spring of water that flows out from the foot of the mountain, for this is where all the inhabitants of Bethulia get their water. So thirst will destroy them and they will surrender their city. Meanwhile, we and our men will go up to the summits of the nearby mountains and encamp there to guard against anyone's leaving the city. They and their wives and children will languish with famine, and before the sword reaches them, they will be strewn about in the streets where they dwell. Thus will you pay them back with evil for their rebellion and their refusal to meet you in peace. These words pleased Holofernes and all his attendants, and he ordered their proposal to be carried out. So the army of the Ammonites moved camp, together with 5,000 Assyrians, and they encamped in the valley and seized the water supply in the springs of the Israelites. And the sons of Esau went up with the Ammonites and they encamped in the mountain region opposite Dothan. Then they sent some of their men to the south and to the east opposite Akrabah, which is near Kusi, beside the Wadi Makmer. The rest of the Assyrian army was encamped in the plain, covering the whole countryside. 
their enormous store of tents and supply trains was spread out in profusion everywhere. Since the Israelites were surrounded by all of their enemies, and because there was no way to escape out from among them, their courage failed, and they cried out to the Lord their God. The whole Assyrian army, their infantry, chariots, and cavalry, kept them surrounding like this for 34 days, until all the reservoirs of water failed every inhabitant of Bethulia. And their cisterns ran dry, so that on no day did they have enough to drink, for their drinking water was rationed. Their children fainted away, and the women and young men were consumed with thirst and were collapsing in the city streets and in the gateways. They no longer had any strength left in them. Then all the people, including the young men, the women, and the children, gathered around Uzziah and the rulers of the city. And they cried out with a loud voice and said before all the elders, let God judge between you and us. You have done us a grave injustice by not making peace with the Assyrians. There is no help for us now. Instead, God has sold us into their hands to be strewn before them in thirst and utter exhaustion. Therefore, summon them and surrender the whole city as spoil to the troops of Holofernes and to all his forces, for it would be better for us to become their prey. We should indeed become slaves, but at least our lives will be spared and we will not have to witness our little ones dying before our eyes and our wives and our children breathing out their souls. We adjure you by heaven and earth and by our God, the Lord of our forefathers, who is punishing us for our sins and the sins of our forefathers. Do the things that we have proposed this very day. Then with one accord, a great lamentation arose throughout the assembly. And they cried out to the Lord God with a loud voice. But Uzziah said to them, Courage, my brothers. Let us wait five days more for the Lord our God to turn his mercy toward us again, for he will not utterly forsake us. But if those days pass by and no help comes for us, I will do as you say. Then he dismissed the people to their various posts and they returned to the walls and towers of their city. He sent the women and children to their homes. Throughout the city, they were in great misery. Chapter 8 Now in those days, Judith heard about these things. She was the daughter of Merari, son of Buzz, son of Joseph, son of Uzziel, son of Elkiah, son of Hananiah, son of Gideon, son of Rephaim, son of Ahitub, son of Eliah, son of Hilkiah, son of Eliab, son of Nathanael, son of Shalumiel, son of Zurishaddai, son of Simeon, son of Israel. Her husband, Manasseh, who belonged to her tribe and family, had died during the time of the barley harvest. While he was in the field supervising those who bound the sheaves, he suffered sunstroke. And he took to his bed and died in his native city, Bethulia. So he was buried with his forefathers in the field between Dothan and Balaman. The widowed Judith remained three years and four months at home where she set up a tent for herself on the roof of her house. She put sackcloth around her waist and dressed in widow's weeds. She fasted all the days of her widowhood, except Sabbath eves and the Sabbaths and new moons eves and the new moons and the festivals and days of rejoicing of the house of Israel. She was shapely and very lovely to behold. Her husband Manasseh had left her gold and silver, male and female slaves, livestock, 
and fields, and she maintained this estate. No one spoke ill of her, for she feared God with great devotion. And Judith heard the harsh words which the people, discouraged by their lack of water, had spoken against the ruler. And she heard everything that Uzziah said to them in reply, and how he swore that he would surrender the city to the Assyrians at the end of five days. Therefore, she sent her maid, who was in charge of all she possessed, to summon Uzziah and Cabrus and Carmi, the elders of her city. When they came to her, she said to them, Listen to me, rulers of the people of Bethulia. What you have said to the people today is not right. You have even sworn and pronounced this oath between God and yourselves, promising to surrender the city to our enemies at the end of five days, unless the Lord turns to help us. Who are you then to have put God to the test today? setting yourselves up in the place of God in human affairs? It is the Lord Almighty whom you are putting to the test. Will you never learn anything? You cannot plumb the depths of the human heart or understand the workings of the human mind. How then do you expect to search out God who has made all these things or to discern his mind or to comprehend his plan? No, my brothers, do not anger the Lord our God, for if he does not choose to come to our aid within these five days, it is within his power to protect us at any time he pleases, or even to destroy us before the face of our enemies. It is not for you to make the Lord our God give surety for his plans. For God is not a man that he should be moved by threats, nor a son of man, that he may be given an ultimatum. Therefore, while we wait for his salvation, let us call upon him to help us, and he will hear our voice, if it is his good pleasure. For never in our generation, nor in these present days, has there arisen any tribe, or clan, or country, or city of ours that worships gods made with hands as was done in former days. It was for such conduct that our forefathers were handed over to the sword and to pillage and fell with great catastrophe before our enemies. But since we acknowledge no other God but him, we hope that he will not disdain us or any of our people. For if we are taken, all Judah will be taken and our sanctuary will be plundered and God will make us pay for its profanation with our blood. For the slaughter of our kinsmen, and for the taking of exiles from the land, and for the desolation of our inheritance, all this he will bring upon our heads. Wherever we shall be enslaved among the nations, we shall be an offense and a reproach in the eyes of those who acquire us. For our enslavement will not be turned to our benefit, but the Lord our God will maintain it to our dishonor. Therefore, my brothers, let us set an example for our kinsmen, for their lives depend upon us. And the defense of the sanctuary, both the temple and the altar, rests upon us. In spite of all this, let us give thanks to the Lord our God for putting us to the test, as he did with our forefathers. Recall how he dealt with Abraham, and how he tested Isaac, and everything that happened to Jacob in Paddan Aram, while he was tending the flocks of Laban, his mother's brother. It was not for vengeance that the Lord tried them by fire to examine their hearts, nor has he done so with us. But the Lord scourges those who are close to him, in order to admonish them. Then Uzziah said to her, All that you have said was spoken from a true heart, and there is no one who can gainsay your words. Today is not the first time your wisdom has been evident, 
but from the beginning of your days all the people have recognized your understanding, for your heart's disposition is right. But the people were so tortured with thirst that they compelled us to speak to them as we did, and to bind ourselves by an oath that we cannot break. But since you are a God-fearing woman, pray for us, so that the Lord may send us rain to fill up our cisterns, lest we continue to grow even weaker. Then Judith said to them, Listen to me. I am about to do something that will be passed down through all generations among the descendants of our race. Stand at the city gate tonight, and let me go out with my maid. And within the days which you have promised to surrender the city to our enemies, the Lord will deliver Israel by my hand. Only do not inquire into what I am doing, for I will not tell you until my plan has been accomplished. Uzziah and the ruler said to her, Go in peace, and may the Lord God go before you to take vengeance upon our enemies. So they withdrew from the tent and returned to their posts. Chapter 9 Then Judith threw herself down prostrate, put ashes on her head, and uncovered the sackcloth she was wearing. At the very time when the evening incense was being offered in the temple of God in Jerusalem, Judith cried out to the Lord with a loud voice and said, O oh Lord, God of my forefather Simeon, into whose hand you put a sword to take revenge upon those strangers who had immodestly loosened the virgin's fillet and shamefully exposed her thighs and disgracefully violated her womb. For you said, It shall not be done, and yet they did it. Therefore you handed their rulers over to be slaughtered, and their bed in which they lay deceived and which had felt the shame of their own deceiving was stained with their blood. And you struck down slaves together with princes, and princes on their thrones. Their wives you handed over to plunder, and their daughters to captivity, and you divided all the spoils among your beloved sons. For your sons burned with zeal for you, and in abhorrence that their own blood had been defiled, called upon you for help. O oh God, my God, hear me also a widow. For you were the author of these events, and those that preceded, and those that followed. You have planned the things that are present, as well as those that are to come. Whatever you devise comes into being. The things you decide on come forward and say, Here we are. For all your ways are prepared in advance, and your judgment is made with foreknowledge. Here now are the Assyrians, a vast force, priding themselves in their horses and riders, boasting in the strength of their infantry, and trusting in the shield and spear, bow and sling. They do not know that you are the Lord who crushes warfare. Yahweh is your name. Shatter their strength in your might and bring down their force in your wrath, for they have resolved to profane your sanctuary and to defile the dwelling where your glorious name resides and to break off the horns of your altar with the sword. Behold their pride and send forth your wrath upon their heads. Give to me, a widow, the strong hand to execute my plan. By the deceit of my lips, strike down the slave together with the prince, and the prince together with his servant. Crush their pride by the hand of a woman. For your strength does not stand in numbers, nor does your power depend upon stalwart men. But you are the God of the lowly, the helper of the oppressed, the upholder of the weak, the protector of the forsaken, the savior of those without hope. Please, please, God of my forefather, God of the heritage of Israel, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, King of all your creation, hear my prayer. Make my deceitful words bring wound and bruise upon those who have planned cruel things against your covenant, 
and against your holy temple, and against Mount Zion, and against the house your children have inherited. Let your whole nation and every tribe know and understand that you are God, the God of all power and might, and that there is no other who protects the people of Israel but you alone. Chapter 10 As soon as Judith had ceased crying out to the God of Israel and had concluded all these words, she rose from where she lay prostrate. She called her maid, and they went down into the house where she spent her Sabbaths and her feast days. She removed the sackcloth she had been wearing, took off her widow's garments, washed her body with water, and anointed herself with precious ointment. She arranged her hair and bound it with a fillet and dressed herself in the festive attire that she used to wear while her husband Manasseh was living. She chose sandals for her feet, and put on her anklets, bracelets, rings, earrings, and all her other jewelry. In this way, she made herself very beautiful, to captivate the eyes of all the men who should see her. She gave her maid a leather skin of wine and a cruise of oil. She filled a bag with roasted grain, dried fig cakes, and fine bread. Then she wrapped up all these provisions and gave them to the maid to carry. Then they went out to the gate of Bethulia and found Isaiah standing there with the elders of the city, Cabris and Carmi. When these men saw Judith transformed in appearance and dressed differently, they were very greatly astounded at her beauty and said to her, May the God of our fathers grant you favor and fulfill your plans for the glory of the Israelites and the exaltation of Jerusalem. She bowed down to God. Then she said to them, Order the city gate to be opened for me, so that I may go out and accomplish what we discussed. So they ordered the young men to open the gate for her as she requested. When they had done this, Judith went out, accompanied by her maid. The men of the city watched her until she had gone down the mountain and crossed the valley, where they lost sight of her. As Judith and her maid walked straight on through the valley, they encountered an Assyrian patrol. The men took her into custody and asked her, To what people do you belong? And where are you coming from? And where are you going? She replied, I am a daughter of the Hebrews, but I am fleeing from them because they are about to be delivered up to you as prey. I have come to see Holofernes, the commander-in-chief of your army, to give him a true report. I will show him the route by which he can ascend and take possession of the whole mountain district without losing a single one of his men, captured or slain." When the men heard her words and had gazed upon her face, which was marvelously beautiful in their eyes, they said to her, By promptly coming down to see our master, you have thus saved your life. Now go at once to his tent. Some of us will escort you and hand you over to him." So they detailed a hundred of their men to accompany her and her maid, and these conducted them to Holofernes' tent. And the news of her arrival spread among the tents, drawing a tumultuous crowd throughout the whole camp. They came and gathered around her as she stood waiting outside Holofernes' tent while he was being informed about her. They marveled at her beauty, admiring the Israelites because of her. And they said to one another, Who can despise this people who has women such as this among them? It is not wise to leave one of their men alive, for if any were to be spared, they could beguile the whole earth. Then, those who slept beside Holofernes and all his servants came out and ushered her into the tent. 
Holofernes was reclining on his bed, under a canopy that was woven with purple and gold, emeralds, and other precious stones. And they went and announced her to him. And he came out to the tent's antechamber, with silver lamps carried before him. And when Judith came into the presence of Holofernes and his servants, they all marveled at the beauty of her face. She threw herself down prostrate before him, but his servants raised her up. Chapter 11 Then Holofernes said to her, Take courage, woman, and have no fear in your heart, for never have I harmed anyone who chose to serve Seleucus, king of all the earth. Even now, I would not have raised my spear against your people who dwell in the mountain region had they not slighted me and brought this upon themselves. But now, tell me why you have fled from them and have come over to us. In any event, you have come to safety. Take courage. You will live tonight and ever after. No one will harm you. Rather, you will be well treated as are all the servants of my lord, King Seleucus. Judith answered him, Accept the words of your servant, and let your handmaid speak in your presence. I will tell no lie to my lord this night. And if you follow out the words of your handmaid, God will give you complete success, and my lord will not fail to achieve his purposes. By the life of Seleucus, king of the whole earth, and by the power of him who has sent you to set all souls aright. Not only do men serve him through you, but through your strength, even the beasts of the field and the cattle and the birds of the heavens will live for Seleucus and his whole house. Indeed, we have heard of your wisdom and sagacity, and it is reported throughout the whole earth that you alone are the most competent in the whole kingdom, rich in experience and distinguished in military strategy. Now, as for Achior's speech in your council, we have heard his words. When the men of Bethulia spared him, he told them everything he had said to you. Therefore, my lord and master, do not disregard his word, but keep it in your mind, for it is true. Indeed, our race cannot be punished, nor does the sword prevail against them unless they sin against their God. But now, lest my Lord be repulsed and ineffectual, death will fall upon them, for their sins have caught up with them, by which they provoke their God to anger whenever they are deviant. Since their food supply is exhausted and their water has almost given out, they have planned to kill their livestock and have determined to consume all the things which God in his laws has forbidden them to eat. They have decided to consume the first fruits of the grain and the tenths of the wine and oil, which they had sanctified and set aside for the priests who minister in the presence of our God in Jerusalem, things it is not lawful for any layman even to touch with his hands. Since even the inhabitants in Jerusalem have been doing this, they have sent messengers there in order to bring back to them authorization from the council of the elders. On that very day, when the response reaches them, and they act upon it, they will be handed over to you for destruction. As soon as I, your servant, learned all this, I fled from them. God has sent me to perform with you such deeds that will astonish the whole world wherever people shall hear about them. Your handmaid is, indeed, a God-fearing woman, and serves the God of heaven night and day. So I will remain with you, my Lord. But every night your handmaid will go out into the valley and pray to God. He will tell me when the Israelites have committed their sins. Then I will come and let you know, so that you may go out with your whole army, and not one of them will be able to withstand you. Then I will lead you through Judah until you come to Jerusalem, and there I will set your throne. 
you will drive them like sheep that have no shepherd, and not even a dog will so much as growl at you. For this was told to me according to my foreknowledge. It was announced to me, and I in turn have been sent to tell you. Her words pleased Holofernes and all his servants. They marveled at her wisdom and said, No other woman from one end of the earth to the other looks so beautiful and speaks so wisely. Then Holofernes said to her, God has done well in sending you ahead of the people to strengthen our hands and to bring destruction to those who have despised my Lord. You are not only beautiful in appearance, but your words are well spoken. If you do as you have said, your God shall be my God, and you shall dwell in the palace of King Seleucus, and shall be renowned throughout the whole earth. Chapter 12 Then he ordered them to lead her into the room where his silver dinnerware was kept, and commanded them to set a table for her with his own delicacies to eat and with some of his own wine to drink. But Judith said, I cannot partake of them, lest it be a stumbling block. But I shall be amply supplied from the things I brought with me. Holofernes said to her, But if your provisions run out, from where shall we get more of the same to provide for you? For none of your people are here with us. Judith replied to him, As surely as you live, my lord, your handmaid will not use up the supplies I have with me before the Lord accomplishes by my hand what he has determined. Then he asked her to sin. But she answered and said, Indeed, my Lord King, for this very thing I have come here with all my heart. But now it is impossible, for I am in my monthly impurity Tonight is the time of my purification. Therefore, I desire that you proclaim throughout the camp that no one should touch the woman and her handmaid when she goes out at night to the spring of water. And when I am finished, I will give myself over to the king that he might do whatever is pleasing in his sight. The wicked man did so accordingly. Then the servants of Holofernes led her into the tent, and she slept until midnight. Toward the morning watch, she got up and sent this message to Holofernes. Let my Lord now give orders to allow your handmaid to go out for prayer. So Holofernes ordered his bodyguards not to hinder her. Thus, she remained in the camp three days. Each night, she went out to the ravine of Bethulia, where she immersed herself at the spring in the camp. After bathing, she besought the Lord God of Israel to direct her way for the triumph of his people. Then she returned purified to the tent and remained there until she ate her food toward evening. On the fourth day, Holofernes held a banquet for his personal slaves alone, to which he did not invite any of his officers. And he said to Bagoas, the eunuch in charge of his personal affairs, Go and persuade this Hebrew woman who is in your care to join us and to eat and drink with us, for it would be a disgrace if we let such a woman go without enjoying her company. If we do not seduce her, she will laugh us to scorn. So Begoas left the presence of Holofernes and approached Judith and said, So fair a maiden should not be reluctant to come to my lord to be honored in his presence, and to enjoy drinking wine with us, and to become today like one of the Assyrian women who serve in the palace of Seleucus. Judith replied to him, Who am I to refuse my lord? Whatever is pleasing to him, I will do at once, and this will be a joy for me until the day of my death. So she proceeded to dress herself with her festive garments and all her feminine adornments. 
Meanwhile, her maid went ahead, and taking the fleece that had been furnished by Begoas for her daily use in reclining at dinner, the maid spread it out on the ground for her in front of Holofernes. Then Judith came in and reclined on it. Holofernes's heart was ravished with her, and his soul was aroused. He was burning with a desire to possess her, for he had been waiting for an opportunity to seduce her from the day he first saw her. So Holofernes said to her, Drink and be merry with us. Judith said, I will gladly drink, my lord, because this day is greater than all the days since I was born. Then she took what her maid had prepared and ate and drank in his presence. Holofernes, charmed by her, drank a great quantity of wine, much more than he had ever drunk in any one day since he was born. Chapter 13 But when evening came, his slaves quickly withdrew. Begoas closed the tent from outside and excluded the attendants from their master's presence. They went off to their beds, for they were all tired because the banquet had lasted so long. But Judith was left alone in the tent with Holofernes, who lay prostrate on his bed, for he was dead drunk. Now Judith had ordered her maid to stand outside the bedchamber and to wait for her to come out, as she did on the other days. For she said she would be going out for her prayer. She had said the same thing to Begoas. When everyone had departed, and no one, either small or great, was left in the bedchamber, Judith stood beside his bed and said in her heart, O Lord, God of all might, in this hour look graciously upon the work of my hands, which I do for the exaltation of Jerusalem. Now indeed is the time for aiding your heritage, and for carrying out my design to destroy the enemies who have risen up against us. She went up to the bedpost near Holofernes's head, and took down his falchion from it. She drew close to his bed, took hold of the hair of his head, and said, Strengthen me this day, O Lord God of Israel. Then with all her might, she struck his neck twice and cut off his head. Then she rolled his body off the bed and pulled down the canopy from its posts. Soon afterward, she came out and gave Holofernes' head to her maid who placed it in her food pouch. Then the two of them went out together, as they were accustomed to do for prayer. So they passed through the camp, skirted the ravine, and went up the mountain to Bethulia, and approached its gates. From a distance, Judith called out to the sentries at the gates. Open! Open the gate! God, our God, is with us! Once more he has displayed his strength in Israel and his power against our enemies! He has done it this very day! When the citizens heard her voice, they hurried down to their city gate and summoned the city elders. All the people, both small and great, hurriedly assembled for it seemed unbelievable that she had returned. They opened the gate and welcomed the two women. Then they lit a fire to give light and gathered around the two. Then she said to them with a loud voice, Praise God! Oh, praise Him! Praise God who has not withdrawn His mercy from the house of Israel! but has shattered our enemies by my hand this very night. 
Then she pulled the head out of the pouch and showed it to them and said, Behold, the head of Holofernus, the commander-in-chief of the Assyrian army. And here is the canopy beneath which he lay in his drunken stupor. The Lord has struck him down by the hand of a woman. As the Lord lives, who has protected me in the path I have followed, I swear that it was my face that seduced him to his destruction, and that he committed no sin with me, neither to defile nor shame me. All the people were greatly astonished. They bowed down and worshipped God, saying with one accord, Blessed are you, our God, who this day have brought to naught the enemies of your people. Then Uzziah said to her, O oh, daughter, you are blessed by the Most High God above all the women on earth. And blessed be the Lord God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, who has guided you to sever the head of the chief of our enemies. Your deed of hope will never depart from the hearts of those who remember the power of God. May God make this redound to your perpetual honor, and may He reward you with blessings, because you risked your own life when our race was being oppressed, and you averted our ruin, walking in the straight path before our God. And all the people said, Amen! Amen! Chapter 14 Then Judith said to them, Listen to me, my brothers. Take this head and hang it upon the parapet of your wall. As soon as day breaks, when the sun rises on the earth, let each of you take up his weapons and let every able-bodied man rush out of the city and set a captain over them as if you were about to go down into the plain against the advanced guard of the Assyrians. Only do not go down. Then they will seize their armor and hurry into their camp and rouse the generals of the Assyrian army. When they run into the tent of Holofernes and do not find him, panic will seize them, and they will flee before you. Then you and all who live within the borders of Israel will pursue them and strike them down in their tracks. But before doing all this, summon Achior the Ammonite for me, so that he may see and recognize the man who despised the house of Israel, the man who sent him to us as if to his death. So they called Achior from the house of Uzziah. When he came and saw the head of Holofernes in the hand of one of the men in the assembly of the people, he fell down on his face in a faint. Then after they lifted him up, he threw himself at Judah's feet in homage and said, Blessed are you in every tent of Judah and in every nation. Those who hear your name will be struck with terror. But now, tell me all that you have done during these days. So in the presence of the people, Judith told him all that she had done from the day she had left until the moment she began speaking to them. When she had finished her account, the people raised a great shout, and their city resounded with joyful noise. When Achior saw all that the God of Israel had done, he believed firmly in God. So he circumcised the flesh of his foreskin and has been united with the house of Israel until this day. At the break of dawn, they hung the head of Holofernes on the wall. Then every man took up their weapons and went out in companies to the mountain passes. When the Assyrians saw them, they notified their captains. These in turn went to the generals and the division leaders and to all their other commanders. They came to Holofernes' tent and said to the one in charge of all his personal affairs, Wake up our Lord, for the slaves have dared to come down against us to give battle to their utter destruction. So Begoas went in and knocked at the entry of the tent, 
for he supposed that he was sleeping with Judith. But when no one answered, he parted the curtains, entered the bedchamber, and found him sprawled on the floor, a headless corpse. And he broke into a loud clamor of weeping, groaning, and howling, and rent his garments. Then he entered the tent where Judith had lodged, and when he did not find her, he rushed out to the troops and shouted, The slaves have tricked us! A single Hebrew woman has brought disgrace upon the house of King Seleucus! Look, Holofernes is lying on the ground, headless! When the commanders of the Assyrian army heard these words, they rent their tunics, and their souls were seized with consternation and their loud cries and howlings arose throughout the camp. Chapter 15 On hearing what had happened, the men, still in their tents, were amazed. And overcome with fear and trembling, they no longer kept ranks with one another. But streaming out with one accord, they fled along every path across the plain and through the mountain region. And those who had encamped in the mountain region around Bethulia also took to flight. Then all the Israelite warriors rushed down upon them. Uzziah sent messengers to Betomestheum, and Koba, and Kola, and to all the frontiers of Israel to report what had taken place, and to urge everyone to rush out upon the enemy to destroy them. On hearing this, the Israelites, with one accord, attacked the enemy and cut them down as far as Koba. Even those in Jerusalem and all the mountain region also came, for they too had been told what had happened in the camp of their enemies. The Gileadites and the Galileans outflanked them with a great slaughter, even beyond Damascus and its borders. The remaining inhabitants of Bethulia swept down upon the Assyrian camp and plundered it, acquiring great riches. And when those Israelites returned from the slaughter, they took possession of what remained. Even the towns and villages in the mountain region and in the plain were crammed with the enormous quantity of booty they had seized. Then the high priest Jehoiakim and the elders of the Israelites who dwelt in Jerusalem came to witness the good things that the Lord had done for Israel and to meet and congratulate Judith. When they came to her, they all blessed her with one accord and said to her, You are the glory of Jerusalem. You are the splendid boast of Israel. You are the surpassing joy of our nation. You have done all this with your own hand. You have done great good to Israel, and God is pleased with it. May you be blessed by the Almighty Lord forever. And all the people said, Amen! For thirty days, the whole populace plundered the camp. They gave Judith the tent of Holofernes, with all his silver dinnerware, his couches, his bowls, and all his furniture. She accepted them. And after harnessing her mules and hitching her wagons to them, she loaded these things on them. All the women of Israel gathered to see her, and they blessed her and performed a dance in her honor. She took ivy-wreathed rods in her hands and distributed them to the women around her. And she and the other women crowned themselves with olive wreaths. At the head of all the people, she led the women in the dance, while all the men of Israel followed in their armor, wearing garlands and singing hymns. Judith led all Israel in this song of thanksgiving, and all the people loudly sang this song of praise. Chapter 16 And Judith said, Strike up a song to my God with tambourines, sing to my Lord with cymbals, 
raise to him a new psalm, exalt him and acclaim his name. For the Lord is God, he crushes warfare and he sets up his encampment among his people. He delivered me from the hands of my persecutors. The Assyrian came down from the mountains of the north. He came with tens of thousands of his warriors. Their numbers blacked up the wadis and their cavalry covered the hills. He boasted that he would burn up my territory and put my young men to the sword and dash my infants to the ground and seize my children as prey and take my virgins as spoil. But the Lord Almighty has foiled them by the hand of a woman. For their mighty one did not fall by the hands of young men, nor did the sons of the Titans strike him down, nor did tall giants set upon him. But Judith, the daughter of Mirari, with the beauty of her countenance, undid him. For she took off her widow's garb to raise up the afflicted in Israel. She anointed her face with fragrant oil, she fastened her hair with a fillet, and put on a linen gown to beguile him. Her sandal ravished his eyes, and her beauty captivated his mind, and the sword severed his neck. The Persians trembled at her boldness. The Medes were daunted at her daring. When my oppressed people shouted, the enemy was terrified. When my weaklings cried out, the enemy trembled. As they lifted up their voices, the enemy was turned back. Sons of maidservants pierced them through and wounded them like the children of fugitives. They perished before the ranks of my Lord. I will sing a new song to my God. O oh Lord, you are great and unsurpassable, wonderful in strength, invincible. Let all your creatures serve you, for you spoke and they were made. You sent forth your spirit and it formed them. There is none that can resist your voice. For the mountain shall be shaken to their foundations along with the waters, and the rocks shall melt like wax before your gaze. But to those who fear you, you are very merciful. Though the sweet fragrance of every sacrifice is a trifle, and the fat of all holocausts is but very little in your sight, whoever fears the Lord is great forever. Woe to the nations that rise up against my people! The Lord Almighty will requite them. He will punish them in the day of judgment. He will send fire and worms into their flesh, and they shall weep and suffer pain forever. When the people arrived at Jerusalem, they worshipped God. As soon as they were purified, they offered their holocausts, their free will offerings, and their gifts. Judith also dedicated, as a votive offering to God, all the possessions of Holofernes, which the people had given her, as well as the canopy that she herself had taken from his bedchamber. For three months, the people continued feasting in Jerusalem before the sanctuary, and Judith remained with them. When those days were over, each one returned home to his own inheritance. Judith went back to Bethulia and remained on her estate. For the rest of her life, she was renowned throughout the whole land. Many desired to marry her, but after the death of her husband Manasseh, who was gathered to his people, she gave herself to no man all the remaining days of her life. She became more and more famous and grew old in her husband's house, reaching the age of 105. She died in Bethulia, where they buried her in the tomb of her husband Manasseh. And the house of Israel mourned her for seven days. Before she died, she distributed her property to all of the relatives closest to her husband Manasseh and to her own closest relatives, and she set her maid free. And for the rest of the lifetime of Judith, no one ever again spread terror among the Israelites, 
not even for a long time after her death.